Hey everybody, welcome to this week's episode of the Slow Twitch Podcast. I am joined, as always, by the one, the only, the principal, Eric Wynn. Eric, hey, how are you? I'm good, Ryan. How are you doing today? I'm doing pretty well. Two weeks in a row. <laughs> I think we actually skipped a week. No, we recorded last week. No, it was the week before. No, it, it, it came out last week. So. Oh, God. <laughs> I'm all screwed up. Well, <laughs> oh, my. I could be wrong. What else is new? Um, but hey, we are joined this week by uh, a special guest, the one and only Jimmy Riccatello. Jimmy, how are you? I'm awesome. Thanks for having me, you guys. Been a while. So um, we're here to kind of dissect a little bit of what has changed and what has certainly not changed in the Iron Man rulebook for 2024 as we're gearing up. Um, for the kickstart of the new Iron Man Pro series uh, with Oceanside right around the corner. So lots of excitement in the pro triathlon world right now. Super deep pro list, too. It's an incredible oh number of people racing. I think we're at 114 right now, total, men and women. It's, I mean, that's always a big debut, but cheapers, that's cool. I know it's fascinating because the PTO can't even pay enough pros to fill their race. Yet you guys have 120 pros showing up. Yeah, it's an iconic venue, right? Um, it is. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm always, missing it. Oh, achievers! Well, no. it's it's always awesome to to be at that one. It's where the 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 sport started for me. Honestly, um, it's just a special venue. So. So, Jimmy, like, let's back up before we start getting into the rule book. You know, you've just mentioned that Oceanside was really kind of where you got started in triathlon. Like, tell us how you got started and kind of how you wound up uh, doing what you're doing today with Ironman. How much time do we have? Uh, <laughs> you, I will time you. Don't worry. No, the 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 brief story. I I was a crummy swimmer in high school, um, not, not good enough to, to swim in college. I, I went to the university of Arizona, study architecture. Um, I swam a little bit and I took a water polo class from a guy named George Dallum, who was a triathlete, uh, an esteemed triathlete here, our kind of our local hero guy, which honestly I had no, I didn't know the sport existed back then. Um, but I, I was impressed with George, um, as an athlete. And, uh, kind of wanted to, wanted to be like him. So I started, started running. Um, I rode my bike to school every day. So, you know, didn't have a car. So I had that going for me. And anyways, I jumped in a race and did okay. The, the following year in 85, I went to USTS Phoenix, which was our, our big kind of the equivalent of the 70.3 back then. And, you know, a big series of Olympic distance races and got second to Tinley. I actually got disqualified in that race for uh for 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 being a domestique to to uh an athlete that you guys probably know in prominent slow twitch uh guy who sat on my wheel the whole the whole race and nobody knew who i was so they they assumed i didn't do the swim this is 85 mind you right so wasn't televised wasn't uh anyways i was like i, I did the swim and to be my, my peers backed me up. Yeah, he was in the water. I was right next to him. And so they reinstated me, but they, they got rid of uh, the guy who ended, who was in second. That moved me up from third to second. And uh, the rest is history. And it's so, hey, Wait, who I got an early... Guy? Oh, I'll let you guys figure that out. I'll let you, you have to go back and look at the, look at the results. And um, because he would never draft. I have a you know sneaking I mean? suspicion. Yeah, free so, t-shirt for anyone that could figure it out and post it <laughs> on the form. Tim, they might know. Um, so anyways, uh, I, I became uh, aware of the rules and officiating in 85. Um, and it was a, fo a focus of mine. B became a big athlete advocate on the rules side um, to, to the extent of getting on the athletes advisory board that I think USAT um, USA Tri organized back in the day. Um, 
when I wanted to affect the rules, I was told, hey, you know, by, by, by the USAT commissioner officials that, you know, he personally didn't write the rules. And if I wanted to affect change that I needed to get on the board of, of directors for USAT, which I did, um, I spent six years there was for the most part horribly ineffective, but it was an awesome learning experience and, and it really clued me into the the, the politics of the sport. Um, and then fast forward to 2005, Ironman asked if I would would help out um, in the, the officiating side when they when they were doing that on their own. Um, I, I initially didn't want to do it, but then decided, you know what better way to to put my money where my mouth was and have have an input, and so it started primarily as a way to to liaise between Ironman and, and the pros specifically. But then it just morphed into, you know, um, helping create a like a sustainable ecosystem of refs, um, primarily in the U.S. And then it just mushroomed out into some oversight globally. Um, and now, now my my. My position with Ironman is it, it's changed over the years. I'm not the, the the head referee of Ironman. We don't we don't have that position anymore. Um, but I'm I'm in overseeing rules and special projects. Um, so still, you know, things like Race Ranger. Um, still liaising with World Tri on um, rules, rules consistency, um, things like that. So that's that's my my history in a nutshell. I'm leaving out all the all the times I won triathlons around the world and you know things right. like that. But that's a, you know you can have me on another time and, and I can tell you how awesome I was. The older I get, the better so, I was. By the way, but. naturally, right? Um, <laughs> so backing up for a second, but this is actually this ties into kind of everything, right? Like, so why is there an Ironman specific rule book? And not necessarily, you know, like either following the home national governing body or, you know, in the case of World Triathlon, right? Like it kind of ties back to like Ironman's stance with world, like the prior World Triathlon ITU. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the on the first page of our rule book, it says that the, the Ironman competition rules are based on on the World Triathlon competition rules and and we've we've put on events all over the world 50 countries i think um and we're we're using you know like usa triathlon for oceanside right and the dtu for Ironman in germany and so the 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 refs there are are educated based on the the world triathlon competition rules so our rules are sub substantively the same, right? There's subtle differences, uniforms, and maybe other a couple of other things. But as far as twelve meters, penalty tents, and all those other things, we're, we align, and and it's been give and take over the years. Um, with them, they've 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 made a lot of changes based on input we've given them. We've adopted uh, rules and policies that they have. But to to kind of answer your your question a, a bit more directly. When I started in 2005, um, USA Tri was was very different than ITU at the time, which is now World Triathlon. Um, and we, you know, because we had athletes coming from all over the the world to Kona. I mean, I, even back then, I think it was. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna misspeak, but 50% of the of the athletes came from from outside the U.S. You know, roughly. Um, so it was in our best interest, you know, to, to, that their equipment that they bring, you know, with them and use in Europe could also be used in the U S and, you know, you just look at the helmets, right. Back, back in the day. Right. I mean, you had to, to, to have a helmet that had a CPSC sticker, but if you bought your helmet in Europe, it, it at a, at a bike shop from Giro, a Giro bike helmet, you know, to be sold in that shop over there, the, the standard was CEN or CE. And, you know, for a while, USAT wasn't keen on, on have that, you know, they wanted everybody to have that, that helmet. And so we, we wanted a rule book that was more aligned with what the rest of the world was doing. So we went to USAT and asked for permission 
to use a rule book that was more similar at the time to ITU. Um, you remember back in the day, I mean, USAT's draft zone was seven meters, three bike links, right? And we wanted a bigger one. So we asked for permission. They, they, they granted it, which was awesome. Um, and, and then the only issues we had were that, you know, Ironman events had rules that were vastly different from USAT's. And, and so then over the years, diplomacy wise, we, we've been working closely with USAT to, to, to try to nudge them towards this global rules harmony project that, that we kind of started years ago, um, and, and are still involved in. And now, you know, as of, you know, 2023 and 22, I think, I think USAT and World Tri are on the same page. And so, you know, every, everything's cool now, but there were differences. Ironman didn't, you know, made you wear a shirt in a triathlon and, and, and you could go to the Tucson Tri and, and race in your Speedo only, which was obviously fine by me if you've seen the pictures. Um, but anyway, it was just a matter of all getting on the same page and we're, it's still a work in progress. But I, th I think that answered your question, I hope. Yeah. Where do you, where would you say the biggest gap remains between, say, you know, the Ironman rules and World Triathlon at this point? I, honestly, there's no big gap, really, Ryan. I mean, um, I think the uniforms is, is still something, you know, that, that you know, World Tri is geared more towards that, um, the, the, the World Tri World Championship type of thing where you go in with the USAT kit, right? And, and if you're a USAT national member, you buy your kit from whoever makes their the national team kits. They're all uniform, look the same. Um, their events were, were typically shorter. You know, and then in Ironman events, you, you, you know, you need to be, you know, hydration, heat management, all these factors came into play that they didn't really need to focus on. Um, to give you an example, and I think the uniforms, Ryan, to answer your question, and is the biggest gap, and it's not very big, <laughs> but they, you know, well, try had a rule a few years ago that you couldn't even have a zipper on the front of your kit. You know, it had to be on the back. And so we're like, hey, you guys, you know, here's what people are wearing nowadays. And they're like, okay, cool. And they put that in. But then their rule still says you, you can only unzip to your sternum. And we're like, that doesn't work for us. It's impossible to enforce that. We can't. Uh, number one, I don't, you know, we don't want to, we certainly don't want to zip anybody's kit up for them. So the, the, the compromise was it just has to be connected at the bottom in Ironman events versus being zipped up to your stern. So, um, yeah. yeah and, and, you know, to that point, right, like with the, going to uniforms specifically, right, like this was one of the things where, you know, wording has changed slightly over the years in terms of how far you can unzip your kit in an Ironman event. And so like at this point, you know, for clarity, it's to where the bottom of the zipper is. It's just got to stay connected. There isn't Correct. the, you know, policing of how far exactly down your sternum. Cause I was there for, <laughs> and yeah. being told, you yeah. know, like it was just yeah, too far down my chest. Right. And I mean, you remember, I remember running next to, you know, getting a call. I forget which pro in Kona, one of the, one of the leaders, the zipper kept creeping down. He kept zipping it up. You know, you could see on TV, he's like, shit, you know, and anyway, he had gone to the lengths of, of literally sewing things into, you know, sewing stitches around the midpoint so that it wouldn't go down, but they broke. Um, anyway, it was, it's, it's crazy rule and having the zipper connected at the bottom is a bit funky. But it was a compromise that that we made, you know, and and uh, and World Try is is has been really cool, honestly. And as far as listening to our our you know the practical issues that we have, you know, enforcing some of the rules and making tweaks if necessary. But um, I think they just want the the your kit to be connected and not flapping around, and and not not solely because of the cosmetics of it but there's some decency laws and things like that i think that they're working around um but you know to the to the greatest extent possible we want we want people to be comfortable and and not have to stress too much i i personally i don't it's a funky rule but i don't think it's too much to ask for the zipper to be connected at the bottom yet people still 
still want to, you know, wait for us to tell them to connect it at the bottom. And you know, that's it. Sort of the, the drags of officiating. Okay. So, so let's, <laughs> let's recap here for a second. Right. Okay. So world triathlon ultimately is the one writing the rule book. That's and the starting point for sure. Yeah. That's the starting point. And then based on those rules and the need to alter those rules, Iron Man decides what should be changed based around the differences in races and the types of races and the things that the athletes need to do in those races to make sure that the athletes can be as safe and also, let's just say, as comfortable as possible. Is that kind of a fair statement? Almost, Eric. I, I think I, I would say decide is, is, is a strong word. I, I think that we, you know, we assess their rule book and, and then again, when our, based on, on the, um, challenges that our, that athletes do in our events have with certain rules, especially ones that, that don't really affect fair play for, you know, like make you faster sure. necessarily, um, without getting into the argument. Yeah. Well, you just cool, use an example we, of like, yeah, you just use an example of like uniforms, right? Like, yeah, you yeah. know, world triathlon, they're, they're most of their events are short course, they're draft, they're, you know, they're not out there for eight, 10, 12 hours, right? Mm -hmm. 16 hours. Right, right. And so, you know, clearly a rule of you can't have a zipper in the front isn't going to work for an Ironman athlete. Yeah. If yeah, we so, want the sport so, to grow. I mean, technically it could, correct. but that's going to suck, right? So, yeah. so Ironman so, the, looks at all of those and says, okay, we need to probably adapt these rules and this is how we're going to do it. Yeah, we would. So we would take our thoughts, Eric, which, which, you know, are, are similar to what you just said. You know, we, we go to them and say, look, th this rule is, is unenforceable at our events, you know, understand why you need to have it, but can we tweak it? Or, Hey, our athletes are, are doing, you know, they're out there for 16 hours, you know, and, and th this uniform policy that you guys have is, so we would ask them to consider changing their rules and amending their rules. And so there, there is now a, a zipper allowed on the front of, of your race kit at world triathlon, middle and long distance triathlon. So we, I think we've, we've, we've historically done our best to try to align with them and not sort of decide on our own. There are things like the zipper connected at the bottom is still not in the world tri rule book. And maybe something like that will, will be in the 25 rule book for them. Or maybe, maybe they'll even, you know, go, go Go a step further. Who knows? But once they once they look at at all these issues and make changes for twenty five, we'll see. But I guess the point I want to make is that 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 it's more of a diplomatic process, right? We we go to them and and they've like I said, have been really helpful with respect to rules in uh, listening to our our um, feedback, just just like the feedback you gave. They're, they've been great at listening to that and amending their rules to to meet our practical needs. If it if it makes sense for them, and when it doesn't, they're like, "Hey, that doesn't really work for us." And then now, we try to are there any meet in the, meet, in the middle, meet at the sternum, yeah, yeah, <laughs> or at the bottom of the yeah. Door. And i i I think the other <laughs> aspect Brian. is when you're to to <laughs> to kind of go over is, you know, Jimmy, when you're looking at adapting rules, you're not just looking to adapt rules for professional athletes. Like you have to create a rule that is for every single participant out on the race course. Correct. Yeah. I mean, Eric, that is, yes, that that's a, we, I mean, we have events where age groupers and pros, as you guys know, really, really well, they, they're, they're on the course together, not, not at the same time, but co commingled if, if that's the right word, they're, they're together literally. And so it, it, it would be very difficult and, and we do still have a few challenges. You know, the, the age groupers are allowed to slipstream and they pass and the pros aren't.
But for the most part, the pro rules and age group rules are the same. But yes, we have constraints, practical constraints that we have to consider um, when we when we go there, um, because we are we have for the most part, you know, everyone's on the course at the same time. If that makes sense. I mean, you guys know that we, we send the pros first and then age groupers, but multi-loop course, you know, uh, you get it. And so, yeah, that is a, a big part of our, our um, rule discussions and, and why, why something that other, other people use rule-wise might not work well for us or work at all, yeah. frankly. Yeah. So, okay. So we've established who Jimmy is, right? We've established your history, why you're here, why you're in charge of these things. You know, you're passionate about it. You know, you've, you've, I would say dedicated the last couple of decades of your life to try to make a meaningful impact. And what I would classify as, you know, putting your arms around what could be a, a massively confusing, you know, situation to try to organize it better. We understand that the governor body of the sport, World Triathlon, is ultimately responsible for the rules. And Ironman works directly with them as other organizations to make sure that those rules are and can be enforced. And if they really can't, to try to adapt those rules to where they can be enforceable in a practical way, long term within the sport. Now, rules change all the time because that's what rules do, right? Somebody decides that they're going to, you know, create havoc over here and make us create a rule, right? Now, in 2024, you introduced new rules. And I think for the first time in a long time, you got a lot of grief over these rules rule changes. And so now I want to talk about, you know, and I'm going to shut up here in a second and let Ryan and Jimmy talk about these, but I don't really see that there's a whole lot of new rules being changed, but you would think with the buzz in the industry that like you guys just took the rule book and threw it out and created a whole new one. So now I just want to talk about what's new and why, and what's the big deal. All right. That's a good lead in. Ryan. So um I actually have one last one off of the uniform discussion because mm -hmm. you know there is the big example of Matt Sharp got DQ'd at Iron Man 70.3 Main last year for effectively quote unquote zipper gate, right? And some of the language specifically around uniforms and zippers changed just a little bit, which I think is, you know, effectively an answer to give officials a little bit more discretion in that specific scenario. So you don't have either a, you don't call it or DQ, like you don't have an effective death penalty for it. Yeah, Ryan, I mean, that's, that's certainly, you know, no, nobody, we, we get the rule and, and it has to be there. But um, yeah, I think the, the, that change, and like a few others, was made with with that notion in mind for sure. Um, you know, it's not not, yeah, you're you're hitting the nail on the head. <laughs> um, and so you know the obviously the the topics that are most near and dear to slow twitchers are anything related to the bike, right? Like, if it's bike related, it's going to be you know, just like catnip to our forum. And so, you know, the probably the biggest, you know, highlight is what I'm just labeling the Joe Skipper rule, right? With regard to, you know, um, anything in your jersey, um, like a hydration platter or something like that. Um, as well as kind of like the the fairing rules that are existing out there. So, you know, what was kind of the process behind, you know, realizing, hey, this is taking, you know, this a little too far down a rabbit hole and coming up with uh, this year's rules around that? 
Are you talking about every single professional athlete shoving a bunch of stuff down their front jersey now, right? Is that is well, that what we're I talking mean, about? <laughs> Joe did it first, so <laughs> did he? It's the Joe Skipper role. <laughs> Did I? I don't know if he did. Well, I need a jersey for Iron Man. I need a jersey for Iron Man because it's got to be bigger so that I can shove a bunch of stuff down my jersey on the bike. And then I need another jersey on the run because I don't shove a bunch of stuff down my jersey because I'm not trying to get as aerodynamic. Is that what we're finally talking about? But also, you know, like the the water bottles as fairings around his arms, right? Like yeah. it was kind of yeah. like he he took it to you know the practical limit. Yeah, he did. He he did. Yeah, and and with, with respect to water bottles down the the front of the of the shirt, I I'm not sure if he did it first. He certainly did it did it the best um, or worst, depending on how you think about it. But um, yeah, I you know initially. When I started seeing it at events, uh, when I started noticing it at events, and refs would come up, what do you think about this? And I'm like, you know, from a rule standpoint, it's you ask the athlete what they're doing, and it's like, well, it's, you know, I got a bottle at an aid station, and my cages were full, and I didn't want to litter. I put the bottle down the front of my shirt, and and I drank from it, by the way. So it's not a fairing. You know, it's, 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 it's a water bottle. I'm, I'm using it to drink. I don't want to litter. And I think it it got traction from the pros because refs weren't were, were I don't mean this in a bad way were were clueless to the fact that 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 practice somebody figured out that it saved you five watts or whatever whatever it is I'm that's my own I'm making up the five watts based on bits I've read I have no proof of that but it's certainly faster I think um, and so once the real reason for, for doing it came about was that it, and then it, that it was faster because other pros were in the same boat as us. They're like, why is this athlete doing that? You know? And once they figured it out with their own testing, they all started doing it. And then it, and because it saved five Watts, if you didn't do it, you were giving up five Watts. So you did it, even if you didn't want to do it. Um, and then it was not a round water bottle. You know, it was some sort of shaped water bottle um and then it was you know anyways it started to to trickle down of course to the age groupers because it is faster it's a it's a five dollar or however much water bottles cost these days um solution you know it's not you're not spending thousand dollars on a pair of aero bars so it was easy an easy thing for people to do i started to get out of hand i mean if you read the rule that it, that addresses that um 501 m in our rule book um, you know, it, it, it sort of it said you couldn't put anything in, in under your race kit for the purpose of, you know, that, that was deemed to give you an arrow advantage. I'm paraphrasing. Um, but again, nobody really thought that a water bottle in the front of your kit was, was doing that. And once, once it was known that it, that it was, and, and that that's what it was for. Um, I, I talked to world try and they're like, yeah, we, we don't feel like our rules. Well, it doesn't specifically address that. The intent is 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 to not allow that. Um, we saw the change made in the the World Tri Appendix that's specific to the T100 events. It said no water bottles. Um, it's coming right for 2025 in the general rule amendments for for World Tri. So we, you know, we're getting a head start and just letting athletes know that they can't do that. So. Um, you know that that's how, like you said earlier, a lot of the the rule book intends to pro- prohibit a lot of things, but it, it it's not specifically stated because the people that wrote the rules years ago didn't didn't know what was coming, you know. And so yeah, we're constantly having to interpret the the old verbiage. Does it apply to new stuff? And um, bottom line is, you know, athletes need to know that they they shouldn't put things down the front of their kit. Not, not they shouldn't. They can't put things down in front of their kit. Can't. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I think to that point about you know old language potentially you know needing continuous interpretation, right? Like going back to the fairing discussion, right? Because 
you know, when you talk about, oh, no protrusions off of the head tube or anything else, like some of our forum members are now concerned, right? Like yeah. all these bikes come with integrated hydration on the front of them, right? And yeah. it's like, well, is that legal or, you know, is that yeah. something where it's like, oh, okay, you know, like this is a place where the language isn't necessarily totally aligned with what our intent is here. Basically, people rightfully so are worried that yeah. some, you know, official is going to come in that is having a bad day and take it out on something that probably if you saw would be fine with, but they're not going to be able to go out on a bike ride during the actual race because, you know, there's this arbitrary thing that is in a rule book and yeah, I mean, yeah. it's, well, it's, it's a thing, you know, it's a real it is thing. A thing. It is a thing, Eric. And that's, that's certainly my, my concern and, and, um, in my role as well is that, you yeah. know, there, there's some sort of standards in place and that's what, that's what, ongoing discussions with world try are trying to get at, Hey, what are you telling your, your referee base, the world triathlon certified refs, many of which we use at our events. What, what are you telling them? You know, what, what's coming so that we can let our athletes know, um, what they should do and what they shouldn't. And, and the, the, the highlighted green portions that, 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 that were out there, um, really weren't changes. There were clarifications made with, with that in mind, you know, like, uh, like you said earlier about, about littering Ryan. And, um, so yeah. Um, anyway, I, I think I kind of lost my train of thought and then remind me, Eric, what I was talking about or what I was trying to answer. A lot on my brain, a lot on my brain. Like yeah, yeah, yeah someone's yeah, but, water bottle on the front end of their bike right like yes yes you know, thank it's you. integrated hydration that is supposed yeah. to come from the bike like it, so it, by the letter of the rule like it it could be interpreted as being problematic yeah is it probably not <laughs> no i think that certainly certainly we we didn't substantially change anything we've called attention to the fact that that it, the, the rule isn't super specific, but definitely want to take the, the opportunity to, you know, to let the slow twitch viewers know that, you know, it, it, nothing's changing from, from last year, you know, and if, but if somebody shows up with something crazy, you know, that, that, that a ref looks at and is like, oh my gosh, you know, this is, has taken front mounted water hydration system to the extreme. Same questions they had about Joe Skipper's air bar setup when he had the bottles outside of his arms, you know, Hey, never seen this before. And you know, well, they're water bottles and okay. They're air shaped water bottles, but what's the big deal? I'm going to drink out of them. And this is where I chose to put them. So two, two things, you know, trying to figure out whether or not that's allowed it per the rules. And then, you know, getting, getting a, a revising a rule to, to be more clear on what is and what isn't allowed. So um, nothing, nothing that's, that's been approved and, and passed through the eyes of, of referees up to this point should be prohibited. You, you know, there's going to be the odd one off here, there, somewhere around the world where a ref comes in and, and um, makes that, makes a decision on their own. But hopefully, you know, certainly at Ironman events, when, when we get a question like that, especially if it's a pro, they'll call me and go, Hey, you know, referees questioning these arrow bars. And I get a picture of it and, you know, get, get on the phone with the ref. I'm like, maybe you need to talk to World Try and get some clarity from them. They do. World Try says it's okay. Problem solved. And if it's something that I know is okay, I, I do my best to convince that the head ref officiating the event that, hey, that, that equipment's okay. I mean, it's on a thousand of the age groupers' bikes. You know, go look. And, um, you know, then make a note. Hey, this is for discussion. You know. We've got to keep doing a, 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 our best to get everybody on the same page with officiating best practices and the rules in general, how they're interpreted. Okay, let's let's talk about this for a second because I think I think this is a, a pretty good time to call out some reasons why there are rules, right? Jimmy, I have seen you 
on multiple times before a race even starts. Be asked a question by a pro if a piece of equipment is legal or not. I have also seen you and other referees multiple times have to deal with somebody that comes race morning with something that is very questionable, throwing a Mm -hmm. conniption fit that you won't allow it on the race course. So if you're a professional athlete or if you're an age grouper and you are trying to push the envelope of the letter of the law with something, whether it's a prototype, whether it's in anything, is it fair to say that there is plenty of time before the day of the race to get clarification from an official at the race on whether or not that piece of equipment is going to be allowed or not before you show up race morning and have a panic attack? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, we're, we're going to answer those emails. They're, they're going to get to us, whether the question goes to athletic services, this is for our main events, but yeah, there's tons of time. If somebody wonders or, or they're given a piece of equipment from a, one of their sponsors that, you know, they're like, ah, man, I'm not so sure about that. There there's, plenty of time to, to ask those questions. And, um, you know, race morning is, is not the best place. And if, if your questionable equipment causes you heartburn on race morning, you probably should have asked about it earlier. And then of course, yeah, anyway, that, that's, that's it in a nutshell. Yes, there's, there's ample time. And I don't think the pathway to, to get an answer is, it's not a difficult one to find. It's pretty easy to, to, what is to the figure pathway? out. Who to, who, is it, is, is there well, a general email you, box that people can email? Yeah. I mean, there, there's my email address, which they, they could get, but if they send something to Iron Man, you know, that's we'll says, make sure we put your email address. So the yeah, yeah, yeah. Goes Thank you for there. that. <laughs> yep. And there's, it's, is there a general it, email box that we could put up in the article? Yeah. Th- I mean, <laughs> I don't have the address for you. I, I'm sure, yeah. to say, it's, but but I'm sure I can get that for I'm you. I'm pretty but sure it's athlete it, services at Ironman. Athlete com, services but, is typically yeah, where. Yeah, well, I get any questions about um, rules and equipment that that isn't obvious pushed to me, and then if it's not obvious to me, then I I then see clarity wherever I need to, and that's the process that that the athletes need to go to and. And if they send a a, a a question about equipment legality to Ironman via email, it's gonna it's gonna get to me. Um, and usually, I copy the event specific head referee so that they're aware that that this athlete, you know, it, it has questions and and what was told to them. And that's that's the general process of how it works. You have no okay. idea how happy you have made slow twitchers with three D printers. <laughs> Is that sarcastic? No, 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 you're, you're going to wind up with some interesting, uh, elements to certain things. Well, that that's, yeah. And that's another, another topic. I mean, the rules, you know, there, there's definitely something I make in my garage, even if I have a 3d printer, you know, that the, you, you've got to, you've got to, you can't just strap something together and ride it. You know, you, you've got to, it's got to go through uh, safety testing and whatnot. You know, that that's what companies that, that sell products have to do. Right. And so the, the current rules don't allow somebody to make something themselves and, and use it without, without getting it safety tested. The problem, as you guys know, is man, there's some slick stuff out there. You know, it's not easy for a referee to, they don't have a Rolodex of every single company that makes aero equipment for triathletes and cyclists. So it's hard to spot. But if somebody shows up with something that's noticeably um, uh, unsafe looking primarily, that's the, the key or or the, that's just way out there in terms of, 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 of the fairing rule, relative to the fairing rule, they're going to they're going to get questioned on it and it's going to get escalated. 
And if it's not safe, they're going to be told they can't use it by, by a referee or anybody that notices it. As they so should. the concept of yes. the Rolodex, you know, like uh, that specifically ties into kind of the next point, which is, you know, there, there's been the alignment of the Ironman rulebook with World Triathlon and, you know, um, World Athletics regarding shoe stack height and everything else. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm absolutely positive that not every referee is going to know the difference between, you know, like the multiple versions of Sockney's Kinvara, one of which is on the prohibited list, right? Mm -hmm. So in the case of, you know, like, I'm a shoe geek, I can tell the difference between those shoes. Like, if I see that on a competitor's feet during, say, Ironman Lake Placid, which I'm racing this year, right on. but a referee hasn't said anything, like, do I have recourse to be able to report that to somebody? And if I do, great. How do I do it? And if I don't, well, why not? Yeah, I mean, the the, the competition rule, the Ironman competition rules and, and we'll try to allow protests. Okay. And, and there's a lot, that's a whole other podcast that we could do. You guys, should, you know, call me next week and we'll do a podcast on protests and appeals. But um, athletes, all athletes have the right to protest, um, against another athlete, their, 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 their eligibility, for example, or like, Hey, this person's in the 30 to 34 age group, but they're 50 years old or vice versa. Um, or this person is using a shoe that's, that's not legal. And you guys, you know, you, you know, I get it. You're not shoe experts, but I know this shoe. And so you would file this protest post race and the, the process is, is outlined. But basically, if you speak to a referee, it doesn't even have to be a formal protest, right? I mean, you could say, look, this shoe this person's using is not legal. You guys need to check it out. They're going to do their due diligence. They're going to go check the shoe out, take pictures of it. And if it's on that, if it's one of those, I think, four shoes now that are on the prohibited list uh, on our mm-hmm. website, they'll unfortunately get disqualified. Um, so the thing that that's the way a lot of these things work to Ryan, I mean, we'll get a complaint from another athlete. Like this is not cool that with this, have you seen what this athlete's using? And it's in a, it's in a, you know, it's in a transition area with thousands of bikes. And even though, you know, refs are doing walkthroughs, they're, they're not, you know, spending time on each, scrutinizing each individual bike and each part on each bike. Um, so a lot of times we're, we're acting on information that we get pr- via protest or just uh, an informal protest. Like, this person used a wetsuit in a, in a non-wetsuit swim or, you know, this person's using an illegal shoe. Um, so your, your, your pathway is to talk to the head referee post-race, let them know that um, you think an athlete's using a piece of equipment that's prohibited and, and then the, athlete, the, the, the head referee will investigate. And if they find that there's credibility, sometimes it's impossible, you know, like, Hey, this person was using right. headphones in a race and, we didn't notice it during the race and we can't find it on any finisher picks, but there's lots of ways we have to, to um, validate somebody's protest. Um, but a lot of things people do, they, they do on parts of the course, you know, and not on others because they're, they're devious. And then other people are just ignorant. You know, I don't mean like that in a mean way. I just mean they, they didn't know, you know, so they did something, you stop them. They're like, Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I had no clue. And, and anyway. So the kind of the last question that I have about changes to the rule book and everything else, like it, it kind of ties into this, right? So um, protests, appeals, you know, like they're all based on rules that, you know, aren't up to a referee's discretion, right? Like you have to have something that's, a little bit more black and white, say like the shoe rule. And so, you know, one area that's always kind of been um, a point of contention, particularly within, you know, the pro group has been the drafting rules, right? Mm -hmm. You know, like the enforcement of them when penalties are applied and everything else. And so you have Race Ranger coming on board for the pro series this year, which, you know, gives you a 
a very visual indicator. And the cool thing about the rear element of Race Ranger is that it records data. So you're able to see how long an athlete spent in somebody's draft zone. Um, I'm intrigued by the fact that drafting remains a referee's discretion penalty, despite the fact that you have this now like hard, a harder and fast data set sitting in front of you. Mm -hmm. Can you explain why it stayed the same? Yeah, I mean, there's their racing, as you guys know, is super dynamic, and there's lots of reasons why a person might encroach in the other person's draft zone without passing. You know, maybe maybe that person uh slowed for for some reason. You know, they they feathered the brakes, you're in your arrow bars, you know, you don't see what they see. Maybe maybe you're fifth in line, they're first in line and it and there's a compression. Re referees are gonna um do what they've always done, which is assess the situation and, and try to try to figure out if it's situational or if if the person um, got an unfair advantage, you know, refs aren't mind readers. I mean, in the perfect world, you know, intent would, would be like a, I'm not saying it's not a factor, but it, it, it's really hard to determine that, right? I mean, we're not mind readers, but did they get an unfair advantage? Did, did, did something they do, was something they did inherently unsafe? They're going to factor all those things in before they make a decision. And so a light may flash red. You know, somebody may go from 12 meters to 11 for, for a second and back out the ref. And this is, this has been the, the, you know, this has been the, the same for years. The ref may call that and one ref may call it and another ref may not. It depends on what they saw. Was this person doing it constantly all race for no apparent reason? Were they just going from, you know, did they go from 12 meters to eight meters? You know, there's lots of things that factor in, but I don't think. I certainly, as an athlete, and you guys know me, I mean, I was a swimmer cyclist who sucked on the run. And so my selfish agenda was drafting. I, I did not want my peers to draft, to, to, to catch up to me on the bike um, or to, to save energy for the run. Um, so, you know, I, I, that said, I would not have wanted to, to be given a penalty the second, I, I you know, for a, a reason that was out of my control and unavoidable by me that I encroached in, in, into the draft zone fractionally um, of the person in front of me. So I, it has to still be a judgment call. You can't just just download the, the data from the device and, and assess penalties afterwards. You, you can't just do that. You know, maybe in the future, depending on, you know, once we, we get a more idea, a, a better idea of the validity of the data, which it's it's so awesome the the stuff that Race Ranger can record, and and we'll figure out a way to to use that in a, in a helpful manner as far as officiating goes. But but the calls have to be made in that moment currently, you know, and and by a referee. So the lights, much like the reflectors in Kona, are make the draft zone a lot more objective for the athletes and for the refs. The the, the tricky part comes in, you know, the refs' tolerance and and. So you're still not going to get away from the contention of, hey, why did I get a penalty for going into the draft zone and out of the draft zone and so-and-so didn't? Unfortunately, that's going to always be there. The, the difference now is that no one can, no one's going to be able to say they didn't, you know? And if you ask me, pro athletes were, were not being penalized for, let, let's face it. I mean, you had to, to get a drafting penalty, you know, it, it wasn't because you were riding 11.5 meters behind somebody right and you were within 12 meters most most definitely um so now everyone's going to know you're not going to be able to say that you, you you know you're still going to be able to say why me just like you know when the cop pulls you over for speeding you know why me I'm going the same speed as everybody else you know you don't like my my vehicle what is it so they're still gonna be able to say that but i think we we you know the ref's decisions our judgment calls just like a lot of professional sports, you know, and um, the the more eyeballs that are on us now, the more there there's that that ability to have that water cooler talk. You know, you you you're a fan of one person, you're like, yeah, that dude deserved the the penalty, and you're a fan of the other person, you're like, that's a bull a BS call. You know, 
almost cussed on your show. Um, so that that's still going to be there, and maybe even maybe even more so. You know, whether the call should have been made by the ref, or sh or a call that wasn't made should have been made, or a call that was made shouldn't have been made. Those things are going to be out there um, still, but I feel like we're giving the pros the opportunity now to minimize their risk of getting a penalty because, you know, brilliantly race ranger has these three series of lights. And, um, so you're going to know when you're close you're, and if, and you should do what most of the pros do already in our races. Now they leave a buffer and the only time they, they push the boundaries of that buffer is when somebody's trying to pass and they don't want them to slide in. And then they close it up to as close to 12 as they can get. And the ability to do that still exists, but you're you're going to be able to be more precise now and more and more careful um, when there's four of you riding and and you're happy with the order of those four. So I think it's going to be a big help. But to to you know I'm I'm talking more than I should about about to answer your question, Ryan. But it's it's not a simple issue. But ultimately, I think Race Ranger is going to be a big help, um, and I hope that the pros use it. Not to see how close they can ride to 12 meters, right? And 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 I hope that the referees officiating our events figure out a way to to communicate to the pros like what their tolerance level is going to be with respect to 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 minor incursions in and out of that draft zone. But but the person that's sitting at eight meters and and is seen doing that, you know, their lights flashing red all the time. It's it's a no brainer for the refs. And 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 the, the who's athlete, ultimately can't, can't responsible the for the refs that Jimmy? Who's the ultimately responsible for the referees that show up to Ironman events? Do you pick them? Who picks them? We we it depends. In the U.S., we we've been able to um, whoever the the we because of the the volume of events we have in the U.S. We've 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 always sort of had a person that we we call the the North American head ref. And that person assigns mm -hmm. head referees to the other events. So, um, you know, we we have a relationship with the majority of the refs that officiate our events because we see them every year. I, I, I personally see them every year. And I have a lot of oversight and in, in, not oversight. I have a lot of, um, of uh, I have the ability to provide input on the way I think refs should officiate and, and the, the way – that Ironman wants them to officiate. We're, we're all very process oriented at the end of the day, though, the refs make the calls. Right. And, um, you know, so the, the focus for, for me is to just to make sure you're technically correct with all the calls that you make and that your focus is on, on fair play, you know, safety is always a factor, but, you know, we don't want people to get an advantage, an unfair advantage. And, and you guys are the ones that have to figure out whether that's happening. I, I you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not on the motorcycle make, you know, with a blue and yellow card anymore. Yeah. Are there, are there statistics that are kept on what referees call what penalties for? And are those measured at all over time to um, not, not have formally. some sort of a judge card? Not, not formally, but, mm -hmm. but, you know, the, the, the contentious calls are, you know, if they're known to to you and 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 Switch fans, they're they're known to us. Um, but obviously, a lot of times the, the the viewpoint from the officiating team doesn't really align with the. And again, you guys, you know, it goes back to c communication and and you know us doing a, a trying to um, speak to the 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 actual issues of why the penalty was, was given, you know, the technical issues, but mm -hmm. people are always going to spin, you know, their version of, of what happened. And, you know, one of the world championships, we had three drafting penalties call, but you would have thought yeah. kind of going back to something you said earlier that the entire field was penalized. Um, it's just that right. those three people, you know, um, were, were talk, talked about their, their version of, of what happened and for the most part, refs in all sports don't, they don't do the same, right? They're, so but the so, narrative is So there's is no, skewed. there's no like, there's no ledger kept with like, hey, this is Ironman, Oceanside 70.3. And at the end of the day, 
here were the penalties that were given out and to what athletes they were given to. Yeah, you know, no, is, that ledger is there... is there, but it's it. There's not a a, a, a rate sheet, you know, referee X okay. over but over it, the course it, of the year. But it, but it, but it, but it exists, right? So if we if you took that data, speaking of data, that would be interesting to like, but if you took that data and you did that at every single race, then wouldn't you have a, a pretty good idea of not only the athletes that love to push the rules, but maybe also the referees that love to really enforce some rules? Yeah, yeah, no. And I, I yes, I, I don't think, I think that information is available. The head refs that we use certainly in North America and I'm, I'm sure it, it, it's the same around the world. They're going to use the people that they, they feel are the best, you know, and, and that come into this with, a, you know, the attitude of everybody's a number on race day. You, I, you don't have a, an agenda and you don't want to have an agenda. You, you know, are there people that, that push the limit? Yeah. And, and are those people going to be scrutinized a little bit more closely than others sometimes? Um, that that's already happening, Eric. You know, you keep your eyes on on people that that push the limit, or or <laughs> I know it, or people that I, I know that, it is. Um, yeah, people that that um, aren't scrutinized. They're they're too far back in the group. But it's like, hey, this person rode. You know, okay, they're in a place where you know they they got they got thirtieth in the race. They never saw the front, but they were right on my wheel the whole the whole time. You know, that feedback comes in, yeah. and so you know maybe. Maybe a ref will take a look at that person, and um, but for the most part, the referees focus on the the race, you know, the primary race, and I think the the, the strategies that are employed are let's try to be as present as we can be for the entire pro field, and if and if we're sitting there, they're going to behave, and and really that that's what happens. It's just unfortunately when somebody breaks a rule in a way that, that, that just can't be ignored, you know, it, it's, again, it's not like they're getting penalties for riding one, one bike length away. If they go into the draft zone and they fail to make a pass. That's technically a drafting violation. They slide in between two people who are 12 meters apart. It's technically a rule violation. And if, and if referees let everyone do that, it becomes a free for all. So they got to make that call. And it's one of three calls that were made all day, but it, but it's like, you know, they're, the refs are jerks or, you know, it's rarely that, that the athletes are. And that, that, that just, that's just sport, right? Mm -hmm. It's not unique to triathlon, you, you know, NFL, NBA, all those, all those yeah. um, sports have the same issue where the refs get bashed for doing their job. It, it, a lot of these things are judgment and people, humans aren't perfect. And even with replay, you know, a lot of these judgment calls, balls and strikes and baseballs currently are not, you know, if the ref gets it wrong, and we see that now with that box on the screen, it's still a strike, even though it was outside that little box. And um, anyway, sorry, I'm, I'm talking more than I should. No, I mean, you've got a good point. And I don't, um, you know, I, I wouldn't say that I know all of the USA refs by name, but I know who they are. And, mm -hmm. and I think they're really passionate about what they do and, and not in a, you know, negative way. You know, I don't think any of them are out there to oh, get that person. Um, but I bet you, if you ran statistics, you'd come up with information of this particular ref calls more of this than anybody else. And this mm -hmm. ref calls more of these penalties more than anybody else. And I think that would be interesting to look at. Um, I also think that, uh, you know, the pros would be the same way that, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, there's, there's a lot of pros that like to complain about certain penalties and yet they continue to get the same penalty over and over again. And you're like, okay, well then where well, maybe, is the real problem? Yeah. You know, is it you the know, ref should... or do you love to just push that envelope? And so across the board, yeah. I think yeah. it would be fascinating to dive into that to where it's like, okay, if you're that innocent, then why have you been called, you know, for drafting 10 times over the last two years in four different countries? Like, is it yeah. really the ref's problem or is it, 
the fact that you are just a really aggressive bike rider, right? Like, and, yeah, and I'm, I mean, I'm just, you know, because, because obviously it's a huge, like this whole thing is a big talking point and has been in the industry primarily ever since live stream has been a big part of Ironman mm -hmm. racing. And it's not going to go away because the more television is brought into this, the more eyeballs are going to be on it. And, and the more, you know, backseat quarterbacks like Ryan talked about where it's like, well, I saw this person on TV wearing this shoe that isn't approved. And it was two months later and I want them DQ'd. And so it's not going to go away. And so the, the conversation really has to be, it's like, okay, how do we get ahead of this? How do we make sure that everyone understands the rules the best that they can? And, and at that point, you know, it's just kind of up to them of like, Hey man, like perfect example. When did you guys know you were going to change the rules for 2024? Was it November of last year, October? Was it March this year? Like, when did you know that this is coming out? Um, I don't think there was a specific date. You know, we started looking at the rules at the end of the year and, and worked towards our, our standard deadline, you know, to get the, the rules published ahead of Oceanside for, for the 2023 season. So it wasn't a specific um, day. In the future, do you think that there's an opportunity to give more leeway on, hey, here are the rules and they're going to be changed or they're going to be into effect three months from now, four months from now, instead of six weeks from now? Yeah, I mean, that po that that possibility always exists. I think it's it's just got to be balanced with the day-to-day -day operations. I'm not trying to, to, to pass a buck and your point is, sure. is well taken. The more the more leeway or the more um, lead time we can give athletes on especially substantive changes uh, again of which there really weren't any this year the better and so yeah you know point point well taken and and it's 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 certainly not lost on on me and on us but there's just there's a lot a lot going on again not trying to pass the buck um and yeah uh, your, your points well taken and you, you know to, to go back to what you were saying before about about the live streams and what we're seeing to me, the answer is 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 kind of what we're what we're doing now. It's just the, the commentary and having people that that understand that you know when a pro gets a penalty, they're gonna they're gonna make sure that they tell their their followers that you know, hey, I, I okay, yeah, I did what they said, but you know, here's my reasons for it. Or the refs suck, and uh, you know they don't know what we're going through, and they have no clue. <laughs> you know, they're gonna say what they're gonna say, right? There is a code of conduct that the athletes are supposed right. to adhere to. But I think everybody, we, I, I have thick skin. I was once in their shoes and I, and I, and I, um, I didn't have the, the social media platform cause I'm 60 years old a couple of days ago. Um, it was different, you know, the way we, we got our messaging out. Um, but anyways, I get it, you know, I get it. And they're talking about things more than we are, but, but with these live streams, we have the opportunity to explain, um, for our commentators to explain what calls were made, you know, and, and find that out. You guys understand the issues, you know, that it's not really known to the commentators and it, so far it can't be what, what the person did. If typically stuff that we see on, on camera is the notification process, you know, so the rule violation happened certainly sometime prior to that notification process. And, but all we can do is, is have people like, do what you're doing right now, Eric, is just talking about it, you know, and, and, and asking those questions, you know, is, is the problem, is it the ref and the officiating in this case? Is it the athlete? What, you know, what is it? And, and, you know, just keep doing what we're doing. And, um, you know, I, I appreciate you guys giving me the opportunity to talk because, because our narrative, the, 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 um, Feedback from our from the referee side isn't isn't always told, so it's neat to have the opportunity to to come and, and talk to you a little bit about about that. Well, we appreciate your time, Jimmy. I mean, I you know I've I've been 
around the sport for a long time. Ryan's been around the sport for a long time. You've been the sport longer than we have. And, and we've, <laughs> we've worked together for a really, really long time. Yeah. And, you know, you've always been straight and upfront, not only with me, but anyone that I've ever seen you personally interact with. And I know that you've got a lot of, you know, people who have an opinion of you that I've never seen in the 20 years that I've been associated with you in some way, shape or form. And, and I think it goes back to the conversation of, you know, let's try to have the dialogue and the conversation of, okay, who really is in charge of the rules yeah. and where do they come from? Why are they, you know, altered for certain, you know, race organizations? What's the reasoning? And, you know, start to educate the community on, on those types of things. So then mm -hmm. they really can take responsibility for themselves to know where to go look for the yeah. rules that they need to adhere to with doing the race. And if, you know, and, and, and leaving the people that know the rules choose to, you know, go to that line every single time with them and, you know, and then complain later when they, they obviously cross yeah. that line and, you know, blame you and everybody else under the sun for the mm -hmm. fact that they, you know, knew that they were speeding and they just didn't see the cop and they got caught. Yeah. But, um, the last thing that I would love to hear from you is what advice would you have for a professional or age grouper of if, if you have question about like, where do they go? Like what, where's the best way where that they could go to figure out what the rules are so they could hear to them. Where is that Jimmy? Um, damn it. You're going to make me say me. Um, <laughs> I think with respect to the airman competition rules. Yeah. They've, they've got to, they've got to get, get to me. For an explanation and, and like you said I, i'm not one to to shy away from those conversations um happy to talk all day about rules i the you like you said eric i mean i i didn't sign up for this job to to um i understood that it wasn't going to be the best thing for me certainly wasn't going to help my coaching business back back when i was doing that as well it, it's not something i did to to be more popular i understood based on my own experience that that a lot of people are friends of mine are, are going to be angry with with decisions that that are made by refs at our event so but i feel strongly that you know rules officiating is are are important they're part of our sport they're not going away and to your point um we just need to we we need to everybody needs to communicate more so that more people are on the same page. Um, and I would, I would encourage people to, to reach out to me to, to get an explanation, um, on any questions they have. And, and to, to the point you were making just a second ago, you know, we, we did and always do, um, note our, our, our amendments or edits or clarifications to, to rules like we did here. Um, but but obviously more more clarification was necessary here and, and even with the shoes last year you guys did it the same awesome job in helping us without even calling us interpret really what we were trying to accomplish and do which was just it's just that consistency and you know and and now bicycles and, and bicycle equipment are in the same place who who thought that they'd make a running shoe that that was that much better than a than a running shoe, right? A, a shoe with a carbon plate and, you know, a big thick sole that literally made, made you a faster runner. And, you know, they had to, to figure out how to address that. Um, and, and they came up with a way and, and we're, we're on board with that. You know, we want to support that. And, and now our sport is in the same place with, with equipment, bicycle equipment specifically. We've got to sort of anticipate what's coming and, and get ahead of it and talk about it so that everybody knows. Um, and I just, again, appreciate, appreciate you guys letting, let me ramble, uh, about that. Now I just wanted to be 
clear when you say you guys, uh, it's not Ryan and I, it's, it's slow twitch as a whole, correct? I mean, we're talking about the slow yeah, twitchers, right, right. the forum members, the, the, yeah, the, the, the people the, that are bringing all of the attention to yeah. the community. I, I want to give them the Ryan, credit because. Yes. The, 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 they're my people. I, I don't, um, I, unfortunately I've got, well, I, I can't even say I have two kids anymore because they're 20 and 22, but, but, um, I can't use them as an excuse. I don't have time to, to engage in a lot of, a lot of it is every once in a while I go in and I chime in for clarity reasons, like you said, but, but some, some of the conversations are going to be never ending and, and that's a good thing. And you guys know me and I know Ryan probably knows how many times I, I go to the slow twitch site because there's so much, um, there's people there a hell of a lot smarter than I am. There's ideas that, that come through that forum that, um, are really, really good. There's there's some dumb ones too, but there, there are a lot, there's a lot of good stuff there and it's my go-to site. No, no, not trying to blow smoke. Um, always has been, you guys know that. And, and way back in the day, I feel, um, thought, you know, allowed me to write some irreverent stories about my experiences as, as a triathlete and, and, you know, for, forever indebted, uh, to him for that opportunity and, and just grateful that there is a place where we can all go and debate and have a, for the most part, civil conversations about um, rules and assets and events and, and whatnot. So um, yes, the, the people of slow twitch. Yeah. Super helpful, super helpful commentary there. Always. Awesome. Well, Jimmy, thanks for taking the time today. Uh, we appreciate it. Well, yeah, it's good because I'm not going to have time anymore now that I'm going to get a thousand emails about the, the rules. But uh, I, you know, you guys... I, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm pretty sure there's an easier way to get the rule book. We will uh, look at that and make sure that that is on the homepage article instead of your email. Uh, we'll start with what that first uh, and then we'll kind of go from there. Thanks, Jimmy. Really appreciate it.